Here in the U.S., we really have seen more investors leaning towards cash. Cash seems to be king again. We have seen almost $5 trillion of inflows into U.S. money market funds. Is this similar to what we're seeing in Asia, or are there any better opportunities to ride out the turmoil? I think many investors have this instinct uh, in phases of great uncertainty to raise their cash holdings just to have a bit more flexibility and also to weather through the volatility in portfolios uh, in a better way. We, for example, have been underweight equities to the benefit of holding more cash than what we would usually do as well. And how does a strong U.S. dollar, as opposed to really all of these crumbling currencies in Asia, factor into that calculation? Well, most investors are globally invested. And so for sure, having U.S. dollar exposure has been helpful uh, to them. We have, uh, for example, uh, looked at uh, very different regions, including Asia, uh, in terms of the performance of single family offices, for example, and have noticed that uh, in both cases, in, in uh, uh, Asia as well as in Europe, there has been uh, a trend to, to outperform uh, the Middle East, for example. Certainly one of the reasons is that the strong dollar has been helping more uh, those investors that are in different base currencies than, um, for example, in the Middle East where it's related to the U.S. dollar much more closely. What about the volatility that we see across bond markets and, as Sherry mentioned, FX, and so much of that has been driven by the King dollar story. But among your clientele, is there concerns about a bond market crisis or a currency crisis? Uh, there's really two things to consider. Most conversations that I've been holding both in Asia as well as internationally um, have been pointing towards higher yield levels, starting with the U.S. and then feeding into other markets as well as uh, opening up gradually an opportunity in bond markets. So there is much more the the leading towards using that as a, a an investment entry point rather than running for the hills and uh, and uh, fearing here a major bond crisis. Uh, secondly, when it comes to currencies, for sure, uh, the fact that we have such a strong and rapid increase of U.S. yields uh, is attracting flows as well into the U.S. dollar. And for as long as monetary and fiscal policies worldwide are are really not coming to uh, strengthen their own currencies, we should be anticipating a, a very strong dollar. Perhaps the one currency to highlight here uh, that is standing very firm, both on monetary grounds as well as on fiscal grounds and generally sound economic policy is the Swiss franc. How much are you seeing that being reflected in terms of outflows from emerging markets? For now, for sure, uh, there are outflows in, in certain uh, regions, those that are typically then at grips as well with, um, uh, for example, current account deficits and, uh, and, and the usual ones that suffer when U.S. yields become more attractive. But then again, emerging markets are, are really not homogeneous. There's big differences. Emerging markets, for example, that are uh, themselves exporting oil and are related to the whole uh, cycle in, in commodity prices are, are holding up much better. For example, the GCC, the Middle Eastern countries, uh, in fact, in, in emerging market debt um, are, in, in our view, uh, really quite appealing because of the fundamentals um, of the country uh, with stronger growth rates feeding as well in better credit fundamentals of corporations. What are the demographic shifts that we're seeing? And from your research, where do you see the biggest millionaire gains coming from? So um, year after year, uh, the biggest increase of um, high net worth and, and uh, ultra high net worth individuals, so that would be the millionaires and billionaires, has uh, been in the United States on the, on the American continent, followed then uh, by Asia with, with China adding um, a, a very substantial number to, to these as well. Uh, most of this growth in wealth and, and how it has then been uh, feeding into, into these trends 
um, is coming from the rapid rise of financial assets. We have been looking at uh, the full year 2021 and the full effect of all the measures taken uh, throughout the pandemic. Uh, this has fueled quite rapid financial asset growth up until the end of 2021 uh, that fed mm. into wealth increases worldwide. Nanette, so tell us a little bit about the distribution, whether it's between rich countries and poorer countries, and within those countries, the 1% against the rest. There is really one observation that um, is, is very encouraging, and that is that over the last decade, uh, there has been an increase of the median wealth. Uh, very much driven by the catch-up that emerging markets have been showing by way of household wealth. In particular, China is, has played a very important role over that decade to move the distribution uh, into a, a, a more equally uh, distributed wealth across countries. Um, the second uh, point to, to make is that within countries, uh, certainly 2020 has shown a, a slight increase of inequality here in terms of distribution in a number of countries, not all, but in, in, in uh, uh, a good number of them. Uh, and that is related to the share that financial assets have been uh, having in total wealth. The mm. higher this share of financial assets and then the higher the share of the 1% right. as well.